we live, yeah? Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, we're just going to see whether or not this works. We've got new microphones, and if there's any problems, we're going to start all over again. So hopefully it does it now and not halfway for the lesson. Uh, but while we're waiting, let's just open our service in a word of prayer. Uh, Brother Steve, would you pray for us, please? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we're blessed and thankful and grateful, Lord, to you for... Lord, to, to study your word, to, to be with like minded Christians and to, to glorify on you. I ask you, Lord, now to pour out your blessings upon us. I ask you, Lord, to pour out your blessings on those who are on the other end of this social media. Uh, that, you, that you bless them, Lord, as well. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We pray, Lord, for our preacher and speaker tonight, Lord. And, uh, and I would just pray, Lord, that we don't just listen to what he has to say, which you've laid upon his heart. But we. Uh, we learn and we apply to our lives. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'll give you some uh, announcements. Um, don't forget Moms and Todd's starts is it on the 10th of September. It'll be 9.30 to 11.30 and Karen's going to be needing some help. Uh, she'll be leading the program, but she's going to need some help the first day uh, because I think someone's away that was supposed to be helping, and, and so uh, she's going to need someone to come along and just give her an hand. Uh, if you could uh, give glory to God, because uh, Lee Openshaw, uh, best dad, he, he, he had a, an operation and it was successful, we, we believe, yeah. And so we give God the glory for that. Uh, also, we have uh, Mary's uh, baby shower, which is going to be at the Gritty's house on the 4th of September at 7 o'clock. Uh, you've got a RSVP. So uh, if you could uh, attend that as well. Uh, what else we got here? I'm working off someone else's now. It's, it's, it's never good, is it, Pastor Grit? <laughs> uh, if you could, uh, what else? So Pastor Nelson's away. He's gone away uh, on holiday. I spent some time with his family, have a bit of a break. And there was something else. Um, I forget, it'll come to me in a moment. Uh, don't forget to be in places uh, this week. Uh, prayer, prayer night for the ladies, 6 o'clock on Thursday. If you can get in touch with my wife. <clears throat> If you have any questions, uh, prayer night for the men at six o'clock. Uh, if you can get in touch with Jamie for any questions concerning that, and uh, just be in your places on Sunday morning, uh, uh, ten thirty, and uh, Sunday evening. And I think that's everything. There was definitely something else that I wanted to say, and I can't remember what it was. Okay. Uh, we're going to continue our study in the Book of Genesis. Uh, if you could open your, once, that's the thing. Yes. If you could pray for the McHenry family, uh, Brother Keith, uh, his dad passed away this week, and obviously he's in the States, it's, you know, it's the only family that Keith's really got left, and so he's going to try and work some way again back to the States with everything that's going on, and it's going to be very difficult, uh, but we just pray that the Lord will kind of make a pathway uh, and everything that will, will, will work out for him, and just pray for the family, pray for him, uh, I know he was close to his dad, and... Uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And we're going to read the first three verses. You've got to get your thinking caps on today. Uh, I know it's been a long day. Nice frame there, Lauren. You've had, a <laughs> you've had a long day as well. I've had one as well. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Uh, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And now today we're going to look at this passage here. We're not going to, we'll come back to it next week. We're not going to get through all of it. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, a few things, I think, to set the stage, really, for the book of Genesis. Uh, I want to try and cover it as thorough as possible as we go through this book. Uh, we're going to look as well at some scientific things, not today, but perhaps in the future uh, as we go through this. Obviously, it, the book of Genesis, as we said in the first class, comes under a heavy attack because of uh, scientific theories uh, like evolution, Big Bang theories, and all those sort of ideas uh, try to clash with the book of uh, Genesis. And as, as Christians, we reject anything, really, that doesn't come from the Word of God or agree with the Word of God. And so today we're going to look at Satan's fall and the effects that it had on the heavens and the earth. Uh, within the last few hundred years, uh, debates have arisen amongst Christians concerning these verses. 
uh, verses 1, 2, and 3. Um, uh, the reason being is because of Genesis, verse 2, here. If you just, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and you read it. And the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And, and everyone recognizes that this verse is describing a chaos. Uh, and so the question is really, is God creating something to start with the chaos and then creating something out of the chaos? Or is the chaos a cause of something else? Uh, uh, we're going to see there's three different views. First of all, the, the creationist view. And the creationist view believes that Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 is just a title. If you read verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Like a title summarizing the next two chapters or the two or three chapters, which goes into detail describing the rest of, of creation. So it's just a title. God created the heavens and the earth, summarizing everything, and then it goes off and it starts to explain all the details. Uh, this is the most popular view nowadays amongst Christians that God, you know, that this verse one is a, a title and the rest is really a description. Uh, and they just believe that verse 2, this chaos, is all part of the process of God creating everything. I said it, that it's been debated over the last couple of hundred years, probably even less than that. And that's because of the second view, and it's called the gap theory. And you're probably familiar with this if you're into creationism. Um, the gap theory is the idea that between verse 2, uh, verse 1 and 2, uh, verse 2 itself covers a gap of time covering... Millions, if not billions of years, okay? The reason they have this view is to accommodate modern scientific theories of evolution, radiometric dating, and dinosaur space. Because remember, people who alter the theory of evolution believe that the Earth is millions of years old, the universe itself is billions of years old, that uh, dinosaurs and humans never coexisted together, and uh, they also believe that we evolved and so they have to have a gap of time. Because when we take the Bible literally, how long has man been on the earth? Remember last week's lesson, how long have we been on the earth? 6,000 years. Uh, and that doesn't fit the evolution picture. They believe man, man alone has been on, on the earth for 250,000 years. Uh, and obviously there were things living before that. And uh, that's the other view, the gap theory. There is another theory, and this is the theory I hold to, it's called the restoration theory. And the idea is that Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 describes a previous earth uh, before the one we're living on now, which was for the fall of Satan, you know, uh, which dealt with, uh, it's going to deal with the fall of Satan. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 describes the world before the fall of Satan. So in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so I believe that God created this, we're going to talk a little bit about this, this perfect earth and a perfect heaven. And uh, the verse 2 describes the judgment of the world because of what Satan did. Satan fell. And so we've got, I've got it here, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, that the earth was in chaos. And we're going to see the descriptions that are given uh, really are descriptions of judgment. Um, not, not part of God's creation. And then, then Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 reveals that God restores the old earth into the earth that we know today, or at least the one that Adam knew. And uh, we're going to look at that as we go through today. Uh, I alter this restoration view despite people opposing it. And the reason that people don't want to hold to anything like this is, I mean, some of them, don't get me wrong, have their biblical uh, views, but they're scared of the gap. Because what people do with that gap, because uh, people are putting evolution in there, uh, dinosaurs in there, millions and billions of years in there. And, and really, I don't think that we should adjust what I think, you know, what I believe the Bible is teaching, just because what people can do with it. You know, otherwise, we wouldn't believe in a lot of doctrines like the doctrine of the Trinity, because people do all sorts of things with that. Uh, but we alter what the Bible teaches. So we're going to look, first of all, at the first heaven and earth and to understand this time period we have to look at history or the history of satan's creation and his fall and there's a couple of passage in the old testament that deal with satan if you go to ezekiel chapter 28 ezekiel chapter 28 and as we go along we're going to build up a picture uh, excuse me adam 
Can you just get a pen out of my bag, please, as we're going off the screen? Ezekiel chapter 28. Now we're going to look at verse 12, but before we look at verse 12, I want you to look at verse 1, because it kind of gives us a, a, a picture of what's really going on here. Verse 1 of chapter 28, uh, it says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not a God, thou Thou set thine heart as the heart of God. And he's talking to a man who's the leader of Tyrus, Tyrus or Tyre and Sidon is a place north of Israel. And this man, he calls him the prince. Even though he's the ruler, he doesn't call him the king because we're going to see he's not really the real ruler. He's, he's, he's only the human one. And he thought that he was God because he was so powerful. He thought that he was a God himself. But look at verse 12. In fact, verse 11, he says, Moreover, the Lord came unto me, saying, and it's in the same chapter, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, and he goes into this description of an angelic being, and the angelic being is Satan himself. And so really, behind this world ruler is Satan. The ruler is the prince, Satan is the king, and it's kind of given us a picture of what we see in the world, that you remember the Bible talks about principalities and powers. And what it, what it tells us is that God has an army, uh, sorry God, Satan has an army around the world, an organized army uh, fighting against God. Whatever God does in the world, is, he has a man behind every leader of the world trying to influence that leader. We see it especially in the book of, of Daniel. And we'll see it again in a moment in the book of Isaiah. But let's just look at what he says about Satan in Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, verse 12, he says, Son of man, uh, take up a lamentation of the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, and, and we're going to break this down now, Thou sealest up the sum, he's describing Satan here, notice he says that, Thou sealest up the sum, and, and it literally means you fill the pattern, and, and it's talking about Satan before his fall, so before Satan fell, he sealed up the pattern. He filled up the pattern. And what that means is when God created the universe or created the world, when God has a, you know, like a blueprint, if you like, he fills the blueprint. He's full. He's perfect in measure. Okay? So that's the first thing. He seals up the sum. And then he says you're full of wisdom. And the word there for wisdom means will, wisdom and skill. He's it, it, full of it, meaning he's full to the brim of it. He's the most wisest of all creatures. He's the most skillfulest of all creatures. That would mean in power. That would mean in anything. You know when people talk about selling their soul to the devil and they say, Satan, if you can give me this, Satan can give it. He can give them power. Uh, I really believe that. Uh, and then it says he's perfect in beauty. It literally means the whole thing. He was the most beautiful of all creatures when God created him because of his, uh, uh, the way that he created him in beauty. And so he's describing really Satan before his fall. And then in verse 13, it describes him again. It says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Now we know he was in the garden of God. But when he was in the garden of God, what do we see there? What was he doing in the garden? He was the serpent. He was already fallen, wasn't he? He was already a fallen creature by the time he was in the garden. Okay, so we're going to see whether he's really referring to the Garden of Eden here or something else. We'll see in a moment. And then he describes his garments. It says, every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, and the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, and the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. So, even more than the high priest in the Old Testament, remember he had stones upon his breastplate. Satan was completely coated in it. His garment was covered in these precious stones and there was gold uh, surrounds holding them. That's the, when it says the gold there, it refers to the surrounds of holding the gems. Okay. And then he says this, he says, Thy workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was... Prepared in the day that thou was created. 
Now, listen to this. It's saying, on the day of his creation, music was created for him. Yeah? And notice the personal pronouns. Thy tabrets. Thy pipes. They were specifically for him. And what, it, what it's describing is that it, it, it's appearing, and we'll, we'll develop this in a moment, that Satan uh, was involved in some form of ministry. Just like the high priest covered in precious stones. Uh, just like the high priest, he was anointed for ministry. We're going to see that in a moment. And also, it appears that it, he had something to do with worship in heaven. Okay? And if we go on to verse 14, then it describes him, thou art the anointed cherub. This is why we know he's not dealing with a human here. He's dealing with an angel. There's different types of angels. You have the normal angels that do the bidding of God. Do you remember that will do the messengers? Do you remember the ones at the, the tomb that rolled away the stone? And they always appear like young men. And then you have the seraphim, and they're always involved uh, standing before the God. You remember they had many faces and the, and the six wings. And then you have the cherubs. And the cherubs are always to do with guardian, like being the guardian of God's throne, or guarding certain things. He says, you're the anointed cherub. This means he was set aside above all others and anointed for ministry. So the order of angels, you have angels that do the bidding of God backwards and forwards from earth. The seraphim who are constantly worshipping before the throne. Do you remember it says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You know, sometimes we pick on songs that are repetitive. In heaven, it says they're doing it all the time. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. That's all they're doing all the time. He's praising God. But then we have the cherubim, which are the highest order. It, it describes in the Bible that they hold up the throne of God. You remember when the Ark of the Covenant was made, and it was the two cherubs that faced each other, and the Shekinah glory would appear between the two of them. And it tells us in the Psalms that God's visible manifestation was between the cherubim. But it's as if the cherubim are covering God, hiding him, uh, protecting him, so to speak. Not that he needs protection, but it's, it's the imagery. And he says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And you see the word there, covereth. That means guardian, like in the sense of a guardian, to cover over. Uh, we see that in Genesis 3.24. Do you remember the fall in the Garden of Eden? What did God do to stop Adam and Eve, to go back in the garden. There was the swords, which is like the Shekinah glory. And then he put cherubim on the east side, which would be where the entrance would be. And so these cherubim were guarding the Garden of Eden so that no one could get in. But it, what it tells us is that he was the anointed cherub. Anointed means he was set aside for a specific thing ministry-wise. He was the highest of all the angels, but he was also the angel that covers... Okay, but what does he cover? We'll see in a moment. He says, and I have set thee so that thou was, thou was upon the holy mount of God. Now the mountain of God usually refers to the throne place of God. So where was he covering? He was over the top of the throne of God. He covered God's throne. Uh, the Bible describes cherubim, there's different types of cherubim, uh, but they usually have one set of wings. And so he would have had his wings spread out over the throne of God during the time of worship or ministry or whatever it was that went on during this time before the fall. And then it says, I've set thee so that thou was upon the holy mount of God. We just read that, sorry. Uh, thou was walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And now he's describing something else. He's saying that you walk up and down. So when he wasn't ministering or doing his guardian duty, he was somewhere else walking around. Okay. But the description is the stones of fire. What are stones of fire? Is it volcanoes? I think he's talking about. No, he, he describes it earlier on, doesn't he? It's precious stones. Stones of fire is precious stones like diamonds, emeralds, you know. And he's saying he was walking amongst these stones of fire. Okay. Then if we look at verse uh, 15, and we'll come back to that. Remember the stones of fire. We'll come back to that. He says, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created and so he tells us that satan was absolutely perfect all the angels were perfect yeah but we learn from this that there was a testing even for angels that angels went through a test now we're not told of the details of it you know we know the test of man there was a fruit there was a, a tree in a, a, in the garden but we're not told the details in in the bible of what what the uh, angels went through 
But we're going to see that he had the power of contrary choice, that he could choose, all angels could do this. And after this choice, the holy angels are confirmed in their holiness, and the unholy angels, the ones that chose to rebel with Satan, are, are confirmed in their unholiness. And so that's where we see the fall of Satan. And we see this in verse 15. It says, till iniquity was found in thee. So sin began with Satan. Out of all of God's creation, sin started with Satan. So before we even get to the Garden of Eden, sin had already occurred. Now, did the sin of Satan cause the will to fall that we know now? No. He influenced it because he influenced the decision of Adam and Eve. But his sin didn't affect the world that we know. Okay? Uh, and then it says, uh, oh, sorry, there's a passage in the New Testament that talks about this. 1 John 3, 8, I'll read it to you. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Now, whenever John uses the term beginning, he always means the beginning, as Genesis beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Literally right at the very start. Uh, it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, uh, we have seen him from the beginning, meaning Jesus, meaning from the very start, meaning from Genesis 1, 1. And so he's saying that he sinned from Genesis 1, 1, really. But we'll evolve that in a moment. We'll, we'll build that in a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 tells us uh, where the sin began. It says, not a novice left being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. He's talking here about the qualifications of a pastor. And he's saying, don't put a pastor that's a novice. Don't get a novice and make him a pastor. Because what will happen, a novice means a newbie. You know, someone that just got saved. Someone that's perhaps too young to handle the position. Because he'll, he'll be put in the position and it will go to his head. He won't be able to deal with it. And what will happen, it will cause chaos in his life. He'll fall at some point. But he's saying that that's what happened to Satan, at least hinting to the detail of the inner sin. Inwardly, he became prideful. But then in verse 17 of Ezekiel 28, 17, he describes more details. It says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty and has corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Uh, he recognized his position, was above all the others, his Beauty was above everyone else. His brightness was above everyone else because of his garments. And so it, it, it became, uh, it says that his heart was lifted up. It was a prideful issue. Look at verse 16. <clears throat> it says, By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. So it, it's an internal sin now, and now it becomes external. So he thinks the thought, I am great. You know, and we're going to look at what he was thinking in a moment. The, the book of Isaiah tells us the details. And then it says, the multitude of thy merchandise. And, and that's the same word that he's going to use in verse 18 in a moment. And it means traffic. It's, it's translated as traffic. But what it means is Satan went from one angel to another angel. Uh, and, and that's the word merchandise. Uh, and, and he was basically confirming allegiance but it says he was doing it by violence, because of his power, because he was stronger. He was violently for causing all these other angels to come along with him and rebel against God. Okay, to try to overthrow the throne of God. Uh, that's verse 18 says this, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries. Sanctuaries is to do with their tabernacle buildings. It is responsibility in ministry. So whatever ministry it was, he defiled his ministry. Okay. Uh, like I say, I think it's something to do with some sort of high priest role or some form of uh, music, uh, worship in heaven. Uh, by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic, and the word there, traffic, is the same word as merchandise, and it means to go from one to another. And so, just like lightning, he was going from one angel to another angel to another angel, and he must be very fast because the Bible says that the angels that are in heaven are innumerable, and one third of those angels fell, so I don't know what one third of an innumerable number is, but it's a lot. So he moves fast, okay? He can move pretty fast. And then he says this, Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God and will destroy thee, O covering cherub. He's a prophesying, eventually I'll destroy you, okay? 
But he got cast out of the mountain of God. What does that mean? He was thrown down. He made it to heaven. Whatever he was planning on earth, he made it to heaven and he was needed there. But then God threw him down. A New Testament passage actually describes this in Luke chapter 10. and verse 18, Jesus speaking, he says, And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. That's how quick God got rid of him, like a lightning bolt. And so he fell. So what we understand here is that he's ascending to heaven and he's being thrown down from heaven. And so we can conclude that there's an earth involved here. Yeah, there's an earth somewhere involved here. And this is what I believe. I believe that there was a pre-earth to what we know in Genesis in the Garden of Eden and so on. And it was an earth that was made of precious stones. Uh, It had a gateway to heaven. This really reflects what we see in the book of Revelation in chapter 21 and 22. Do you remember the new Jerusalem? What was it made of? Precious stones, gold, the same sort of description that we see here in Ezekiel. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment anyway. And that's what he said, Ezekiel 28, 17 says, I will cast thee to the ground. He threw him out of heaven to the ground, which means there's an earth there. Okay, but the, the, some would say, well, that's just the earth in, in the Garden of Eden. Okay, and we'll look at that in a moment. Ezekiel 28, 16, he says, I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Uh, he's losing the privilege to dwell amongst the stones of fire. So, even this is taken away from him, him dwelling here, at least with this, okay? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll, we'll kind of paint a bigger picture of what I'm talking about here. Isaiah 14, and look at verse 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So who is he talking about here? Talking about the devil again, Satan. And he's talking about his fall from heaven. So again, it's talking about him being cast down. Like in astonishment, the very fact, and we can understand the astonishment, because he was in heaven, he was the the canopy over the throne of God, he had all this beauty, he was perfect, in wisdom and strength and everything else. And he's saying, look, you know, how are you fallen from heaven? Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, and so now we begin to see what it was he was saying in his heart. What was the prideful things? And look what he said. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. So this means he not only resided in heaven as a covering cherub, but he was also residing on the earth because he wants to go up there. Okay. Then he says this, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Now, listen to what he said there. There's three things to take note of. First of all, the stars of God, symbolically, remember he's speaking symbolically here as well, refer to the angels of God, and we're going to see that next week. The stars of God uh, sang for joy, it says, when the world was being created. Uh, In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, it talks about that Satan drew a third of the stars out of heaven. doesn't mean he took three, you know, a third of the suns out of heaven. It means that he took a third of the angels with him. So symbolically, he's saying he wants to be above all the angels, okay? Secondly, he wanted to ascend, which implies that he was below. He was lower. But what what else it says? He, He is thrown. He wants to take his throne that's below and put it above. Where's his throne below? It says, my throne, I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. His personal throne is saying, I don't want it down here. I want it up there. So it's telling us that he had some form of dominion where he was on the earth. Now, the problem with that is we know from the book of, Revel- uh, from the book of Genesis, who, 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 was, who had dominion on the earth? Adam and Eve. And so Satan had no dominion whatsoever. And so we're seeing that there's something going on here. You know, there's something going on. Okay. 
In verse 13, there's another I will. These are called the five I wills of Satan. He says, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And this is a reference to God's throne, showing his throne below. He wants God's throne above. Because uh, he says, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Then he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And the word cloud here is the singular, the cloud. What's the cloud symbolically in the Bible? When we see images of the cloud, the glory of God. Do you remember in the, in the Exodus that came out in the, the cloud? What is he saying now? I want to be above God's glory, the Shekinah glory. Okay, so uh, he's saying he wants to be of the glory of God. And then he says, I will be like the Most High. Now, whenever God is referred to as the Most High, it always emphasizes God as the possessor of the heavens and the earth. And we see that in Genesis 14, verses 18 and 19. Whenever we see different names of God, they mean things. As we're going to see this as we go through the book of Genesis. But here it's referring to the fact that God is the possessor of the heavens and the earth. And he's saying, I want to be the possessor of the heavens and the earth. And so what is he really doing? He's saying, I want to be God. And that's why he's likening him to these men. Even in this chapter, he likens him to the king of Babylon. Because these people thought, because of their power, I am God. You know, I, I am God and you know, you're a man. And Satan thought the same sort of things as well. And so angels then were tested by God. And so now we have a division of holy angels and unholy angels. Always in the New Testament, Satan is referred as, to as the leader of the unholy angels. The devil and his angels, Jesus would refer to. The devil and his angels, and we'll see that as well in a moment. The holy ones do the bidding of God. They go backwards and forwards. A good picture of that is in Genesis 28, 12. You remember Jacob had a dream and he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold, the angels of God descending and ascending on it. And that's what the angels are constantly doing, going backwards and forwards, doing the bidding of God. The unholy angels are mentioned in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. And it says, and his tail, referring to Satan, like as a picture, a, a picture of a dragon, drew the third part of the stars out of heaven and did cast them to the earth. So all of those demons now are on this earth. Okay, it hasn't changed. Uh, so it was at this point that God created the lake of fire. Look at Matthew 25, 41. Matthew 25, verse 41. Jesus is talking about the final judgment of man. And he says this, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This means at this point, mankind was not on, uh, not on the earth when the lake of fire was created. It wasn't intended for mankind. The lake of fire wasn't originally, originally created for us. It was created for Satan and his angels. And so it means that whenever it was created, that man couldn't have been around. It could not have been created in man's fallen state because the Bible makes it clear God knew before the world that man would fall. You, you know that, don't you? Revelation 13, 8 says this, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. You have the book of the living and the book of life. You know, Moses says, Block me out the book of uh, thy book, referring to the book of living. Do you remember he wanted to die because God was going to destroy Israel because of the disobedience. So you have the book of living, meaning those people that are alive. And the book of life refers to eternal life, people who are saved. And it tells us that from the creation of the world here, the names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the creation of the world. That God foreknew before the world started who would and wouldn't be saved. And so if you kind of picture that now, if God foreknew that, now you've got to get your heads around this. Okay, if, if God foreknew who would, would and wouldn't be saved before the world was created, because that's what it says there, that the Lamb would have to come, so he knew the fall was going to happen. Okay, uh, that means the lake of fire had to have been created before, because the lake of fire wasn't created for fallen men. It was originally intended for Satan and his angels. Does that make sense? Okay, I know this is probably some new stuff, uh, new, new material. So there are evidence that there was a pre-world. 
The Eden that's mentioned then in Ezekiel 28.13 could not be the Garden of Eden because the Garden of Eden was a vegetable garden, a plant garden. And what's being described there is a mineral garden, precious stones. He was walking up and down these stones of fire. Uh, so uh, Satan was cast out of heaven to the earth. Again, the Garden of Eden we know could not exist yet. John even uh, said from the beginning, according to... Uh, sorry, John even said from the beginning. So at first, I, don't, I forgot to put 1 John, I was reading John 3, 8. <laughs> First John 3, 8. John even said that he sinned from the beginning, from the very start, which would be John, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. So Satan then, we learn, has ruled in this earth. That's why he was so prideful. He ruled on this earth, and he had a high position in heaven. That's why I've kind of drawn the pearly gates here. He had access to heaven. He could go up to heaven. At any time, because he was a holy angel, he was the anointed cherub uh, used by God in ministry, but then he fell. And that's why we come to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. If we go back now, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light. So the time then of Satan's judgment and the answer can be found here. He created in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, which would be this. But then through Satan's fall, the earth became chaotic. Does that make sense? Um, one thing that most scholars agree on is that Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 is a chaos. Anyone got a Schofield Bible? He, he mentions it in the Schofield Bible. Uh, uh, is a chaos. It describes the earth as a chaotic state. However, the question to be asked is this. Did God create the earth in this chaotic state and then bring order to it? Alternatively, did something cause the chaos? Okay. The second option seems the most plausible because when God creates something, he does it in order, in, in perfection and not in chaos. Some examples would be in Isaiah 65, he creates a new heaven and new earth, that's the kingdom. And it's not in chaos, it happens, he creates it and it happens straight away. In the book of Revelation 21, 22, when he creates the even newer heaven and earth, he creates it instantly, it comes down out of heaven and there's no chaos. Okay, the old heaven, the, earth, the old earth is destroyed. There are other lines of evidence that demonstrate Genesis 1 and 2 is referring to a judgment on the earth. The words that are used to describe what we see in verse 2. Uh, look at verse 2. And it says, the earth was without form. Okay, uh, that's the Hebrew word tahu. Tahu. And whenever it, it, it uses the term tahu in the Bible, it always refers to judgment in every single passage. We'll probably develop this a little bit more next week. I'll talk a little bit more about it next week. But it means to lie waste, desolation. These, this is how it's translated in our Bible. A worthless thing, vain, confusion. These are all the words that are used. It is used 19 times in the Old Testament, and in every case, it's negative. Okay? Then it says that the earth was without form and void. And then you have the Hebrew word, bahu. Tahu, babahu. Okay? And ta... Uh, uh, bahu, it means an indistinguishable ruin, uh, emptiness or void. It is used three times in the Old Testament, and in every case, it is negative and connected to God's judgment. In fact, it's used in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Jeremiah concerning the kingdom. When you remember when God creates the kingdom, thousand-year reign, there's two areas in the kingdom you're not allowed to go in because demons are kept there and caged. And the words that he uses is tohu vabahu. Same Hebrew words, and it's the only time he ever uses those two Hebrew words is in the, the kingdom passages and in the passage that he's dealing with when he talks at Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And then he says, And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Hebrew word, again, it means dark, misery, destruction. It's also sometimes used as death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness. These are not positive terms that we see in the book of Revelation. Oh, it's the book of Revelation, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. It's used 77 times in the Old Testament, and in every case, it's in the negative. Uh, and, and also, in addition, it's dark, darkness, which is always uh, the opposing uh, picture of what God is. God is light, okay? 
And then it says, was upon the face of the deep. The motif of water is also used in con connection with God's judgment. For example, Noah's flood. And so you have this world that's dark, that's void, that's vain. Uh, I, I wish if I'd put the passage down. Uh, if I had my phone, I'd get it for you really quick. Isaiah 45, and I can't remember the verse. But it actually says that God would not create the world in vain. Talking about creating the heavens and the earth. He wouldn't create the heavens and the earth in vain. And he uses the word there, tahu. Same Hebrew word saying I wouldn't do it that way. Okay. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 describes a divine judgment. And the only judgment that can be, have occurred was the sin of Satan's fall. So Satan, uh, in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it, when in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, if you got that verse, for thus saith the Lord that created the heavens and the earth, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he have established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. Okay, the word there, vain, is the same word as, as uh, uh, without form. Okay, and it says there that he, he, he made it with form. So Satan dwelt with God, all the holy angels, Satan fell, and he, the earth had to be changed because remember it was this precious place, uh, a mineral garden, and then he changes it to this place of darkness uh, that was void, that had no form, and that, the, 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 that it was covered in water. Okay, So the earth once lo looked like it will in the future. In the book of Revelation, the same type of description is given to the new earth. It is full of precious stones, and there are no vast oceans. There's a river but there's no vast oceans. Uh, and we see that in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And I just want to say a point of warning here. The time gap between verse 1 and 2 should not be put there for reasons many have done so today, and that is dinosaur space, you know, or billions of years, or long ages, or ice ages, or anything else, because it just can't be. In the book of Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through to 21, it describes Adam and in verse, 20, uh, verse 12, it makes it very clear that there was no death before Adam. Life began with Adam. And we're going to see when it comes to those specific days, day one, day two, day two. It even says it was morning, then it was evening, then it was the second day. These were 24-hour periods. They're not long ages, as we're going to see. You know, so I'm not advocating uh, that we should like hold the view that... Uh, we have a gap in this pit in this, so that we can fit dinosaurs in or evolution. I don't believe in evolution. I believe in Satan's fall. I believe that Satan fell at some point. And by the time we see Genesis and Adam in the garden, he's already fallen. He's in a fallen state. He's already there. Uh, now, I did say I was going to show you, if you read the Facebook page, the rest of what happens to the earth. Let me just show you this. Okay, so... This, we don't know how long this period of time went on for. We have no clue. And we don't know how long this went on for in Genesis 1-2. But we know how long roughly this went on for, this perfect Eden garden without the fall. At less than 130 years, we can say. How do we know that? There was no... We, pardon? Not because of the age of Adam, because he lived a lot longer. There's no children mentioned in the, in the story of the fall. It's just Adam and Eve. And the only date we can get of a child is Seth, because Seth's the seed son, as we're going to see. And he, he came when Adam was 130 years old. So we know it was at least before that, probably a lot before that. But it obviously didn't last for very long. But obviously that changed the scope of the world completely. And we had the fall, so there's going to be, there was a period of time when the earth started to change, and we're going to look at this as we go through the story of Genesis. And from Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, all the way through to chapter 7, verse 6, there's a period of time where the earth changed completely. You know, it was in a fallen state. And this lasted for 10, uh, sorry, 1,026 years. We know that because it's from Seth to the flood, okay? And then obviously it changed again because then we have the flood, no, what are these, by the way? Stairs to heaven. We don't, we, all we know is that Satan no longer had access from that point on because he was cast to the earth. We're going to see later in a moment that changes, though. So we see the fall lasted for roughly a thousand years. Again, it could be different because of Seth's age. 
But then we have the flood. The earth was completely engulfed. We're going to see that. It wasn't just a local flood. It was a complete engulfing of the world. That lasted for 378 days. Okay, we sometimes think 40 days and 40 nights. But when you start to put the numbers together, it was, the, the water only dried up on the 378th day. That was the only time it was safe to come out. So over one year, so there was no chance of anyone surviving. And then from that point on, we're, that's where we're living now, the present age, uh, the world that we're living in. And the Bible says that the earth is groaning uh, like a woman in labor pains. It's ready to sort of to give up, okay? And it's, it, it's, it's decaying over time. That covers Revelation chapter 8 all the way through to Revelation chapter 20, okay? But we don't know how long that period is. Why don't we know how long that period is? Because no one knows the day nor the hour, yeah? No one knows the day nor the hour. Because when does that end? No. The, the, the second... Coming when at the end of the seven year tribulation, Jesus comes and he sets up his kingdom. 75 days later, the kingdom's completely set up. And that's why we have Revelation chapter 20. And that's why I put a throne there because he reigns on the earth. Okay, the earth is changed. And in fact, the earth goes back to uh, the state of the Garden of Eden, the Edenic state, because there's animals, you know, lying together, like the lion and the lamb. and and we can, the children will play with the, the adders, the poisonous adders and things like that. And no one, no one will be hurt at all. Uh, why, why, why do animals hurt us anyway? Because they're horrible. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> because God put the fear of man in the animal. And so that, that's what comes after the flood. So this lasts for a thousand years. But then the Bible says, in, 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 I think it's in Second Peter, he says he destroys the old heavens and the, new earth, the old earth. And he creates a brand new one. Now, some people get the kingdom mixed up with this. What's, do you know when it says new heavens and new earth? And it says the same in Isaiah, doesn't it? New heavens and new earth. Isaiah is speaking about the kingdom. And Revelation speaking, I'm going to stay behind here. Revelation speaking about this new heavens and this new earth in the future. How do we know that? What, what do we always say will never happen again in heaven? There's no more death. Whereas in Isaiah's passage, he talks about animals being there. He talks about people dying in the kingdom. People will die in the kingdom. Whereas in the new heavens and the new earth that's described there, that's a different one completely. Uh, so they're, they're talking about com two completely uh, different things. But if you notice, question marks are here. But there's no question marks here. The present age we're living in, Satan has full access to God. We know that from the book of Job. The book of Job plays itself in this era. And Job says that God called, uh, let me get to the passage, Job chapter 1, verse 1. Job chapter 1, verse 1. It says, uh, sorry, not verse 1. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. It is in chapter 1 as well. But, uh, Again, there was a day when the sons of God that's a term for angels, fallen angels as well, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So Satan does have access to God, but not for the old reasons, because he's fallen, but he goes there to give an account. Not that God needs to know, what have you been doing? You know, God knows what he's doing. It, it, it's, it's a show of authority, you know, that the demons are still accountable to God. But if we go to Revelation, and we'll close with this, Revelation chapter 12. And it describes something happening in the future during the tribulation, because remember, Satan wants to destroy the Jews. And it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So, Michael and the holy angels are fighting against Satan and, and the demons. Uh, Michael is the protector of Israel and, it, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. In other words, Satan and his demons lost. And the great dra dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which de deceive us. See there, he's called the serpent from the Garden of Eden. Okay, they just give it, listing off all his names 
which has deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. This isn't the first fall, see, because that was described earlier in this passage. This is talking about the tribulation. And he says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So why does Satan go to heaven? To tell on you lot, yeah? So when we're not doing right, not that, again, not that God needs to know, it's more, you know, of a pestering reminder, where he's constantly trying to pester God, saying, look at this person, look at the, hoping that God might sort you out and get you out of this world perhaps quicker than what you need to be, because you're being a bit of a pain to him, I don't know. Uh, and then he says this, and they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, they love not their lives unto death, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye all that dwell in them. Why, why does the heaven have to rejoice now? Because he can't go up there anymore. He's been cast to the earth. He has no longer has access. Everyone's rejoicing. We don't have to see his face anymore. You know, we don't have to listen to the accusations anymore. But then listen to this. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time. That's the great tribulation. In the middle of the great tribulation, that's what happens. This battle happens in heaven. He realizes that God's had enough. It's coming to an end. And then that's when he comes down with great wrath. Okay. Any questions? Any questions online? Send them to Pastor Gritz. All right. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, uh, we thank you for your word. Lord, what we learn from this is that you know the beginning from the end. And Lord, that's why we trust in you. Because you are the Almighty, the God Most High, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And you know exactly what's going to happen. And nothing ever happens outside of your will to us as believers. And we're thankful for that, Lord. And so we just thank you, Lord. And we just ask that you can be with the people that have heard this today. Lord, that they can take it away and study. Uh, and, and really sort of put these things to the test. Lord, we just thank you. Give us safe journeys as we go our separate ways now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.